got quite a few conferees. I want to make sure everyone has plenty of time. We, uh, let's see, two bill hearings today. So let's get started with the first one, Senate Bill 172. And Natalie, if you wouldn't mind giving us an overview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senate Bill 172 creates new crimes related to critical infrastructure facilities. Um, so current law in KSA 2158-18 contains the crime of tampering with a pipeline. Um, current law there, the violation of that offense is a severity level six non-person felony. Um, Section one strikes those provisions and creates four new crimes related to critical, critical infrastructure facilities. So trespassing on a critical infrastructure facility is um, without consent, knowingly entering or remaining in a critical infrastructure facility or any property containing um, that facility if the property is completely enclosed or clearly marked with a sign indicating that entry is forbidden. Um, violation of that offense would be a Class A non-person misdemeanor. Aggravated trespassing on a critical infrastructure is committing that trespassing offense with the intent to damage, destroy, vandalize, deface, or tamper with, or impede or inhibit the operations of the facility. Violation of that would be a severity level seven non-person felony. Um, criminal damage to a critical infrastructure facility is knowingly damaging, destroying, vandalizing, defacing, or tampering with a critical infrastructure facility. Violation of that would be a severity level six non-person felony. And then finally, aggravated criminal damage to a critical infrastructure facility is committing criminal damage with the intent to impede or inhibit the operations of that facility. And violation of that would be a severity level five non-person felony. Um, nothing in the section would be construed to prevent an owner or operator of one of those facilities that has been damaged from pursuing any other remedy in law. Um, this section also defines what a critical infrastructure facility is, and um, I included that definition at the bottom of um, this memo for you guys to review. Section 2 amends KSA 2163-28. That's part of the Kansas Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act. Normally, we refer to that as RICO. Um, it changes the name of the crime. It, um, in 2158-18, um, since we're getting rid of the offense as it exists now, so we're changing that to update that, and then we're adding those new crimes um, that we're adding into there for purposes of um, the definition of what is a racketeering activity. And then Section 3 amends KSA 2166-04, um, subsection B1, to provide that when a person commits a crime, one of those new crimes that we're creating, for purposes of restitution, the damage or loss um, would include the cost of repair um, or replacement of that property that was damaged. And I can take any questions. Questions for Natalie? Don't see any in person. Representative Carmichael? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Scott, does the bill define a critical infrastructure facility, and if so, how? Um, Mr. Chairman, Representative Carmichael, yes, it does. If you look at the bottom of the second page of my memo, I'm not sure you want me to like read this aloud to you. There's a list of 16 different types of facilities that would be included in that definition. Thank you for the helpful answer. My point is made. Thank you. Any other questions? Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is actually for you or Kathy. Did we get a, a daily agenda today? Because with so many conferees, it's just helpful for me to be able to see that list. Uh, if you did, if you didn't, I will send that. I've got one. Let's... Okay. If you could, that would be super helpful. Did everyone else get it? Okay. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, the agenda that I saw actually didn't seemingly have this bill, so I must have overlooked it as well. If you could accommodate me, thank you. Okay, it should have come at 1147. Uh, you were busy ruling on uh, <laughs> procedural matters on the floor, so I may well have overlooked it as I was paying careful attention to your Okay, it, it's on its way, or it will be on its way as soon as I find all your emails, so give me just a second. But any other questions for Natalie? Thank you. Not seeing any, we will move on to proponents and we have Michael Gillespie up first. Yep. 
We can do that. Gavin, you're up. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you. My name is Gavin Kreidler. I appear before you today representing the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. At first, th this almost reminds me of uh, watching a hearing in D.C. on C-SPAN. There's no one out in the audience, so uh, this is a very weird feeling. But first off, I know the committee's time gets very valuable post-turnaround, so thank you for the opportunity to present in front of you today. Senate Bill 172 is a very simple bill that does two uh, very simple but critically important things. The first thing it does is it seeks to create a comprehensive legal framework with regards to what entities and industries are, are considered in the definition of a critical infrastructure facility. Excuse me. The second thing it does is it seeks to increase criminal penalties on individuals who trespass, damage, or disrupt a critical infrastructure facility. So first let's talk about what a critical infrastructure facility, or I'll refer to them as a CIF, is. A CIF is a uh, uh, entity that is uh, designated by the Department of Homeland Security as such. These are entities that are critical to maintaining our everyday lifestyle. They are critical to our state and local economic output, and they are critical in some cases to the defense of our state and our country. Uh, as the advisor pointed out, the third page of our bill spells out exactly who these critical infrastructure facilities are, but some examples would include a water treatment facility, oil refineries, electrical generational facilities, rubber manufacturers, telecom infrastructure, dams, pipelines, railroad yards, oil storage facilities, among others. So uh, the question invariably comes up, why do we feel it's necessary to increase these criminal penalties? And uh, members of the committee, that is a very simple answer. Critical infrastructure facilities represent an extremely sensitive target to criminal perpetrators who might seek to disrupt or damage our state or our, our local economy. Uh, they also might seek to disrupt the services associated to that critical infrastructure facility and overall create sustained damage and potential chaos. Uh, now I'd like to discuss the criminal penalties portion of this bill. Senate Bill 172, uh, as the reviser stated, takes the crime of normal trespassing, which is a B misdemeanor. We elevate that to an A misdemeanor. Senate Bill 172 creates the crime of aggravated criminal trespassing. And we assign that a severity level seven non-person felony. Members of the committee, for just a quick second, I'd like to talk about the trespassing penalties of this bill. If you look at the list of the critical infrastructure facilities, I would argue there's not a single one in that list that's not inherently complicated by its very nature. I'd even argue further that most, without proper training, are very dangerous. I will speak only to my client's interest, uh, American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers. We're an oil refinery business. It, it is a dangerous facility, and we don't want individuals hopping the fence and taking a midnight tour of an oil refinery. You know, I would assume under that circumstance, if someone did that, uh, they would take this nighttime tour, hurt themselves. We would probably be lucky enough to be sued by that individual for them hopping our fence. Uh, the next uh, crime I would like to discuss is criminal damage. There was already current legislation on the books regarding damaging pipelines in the state of Kansas. That was assigned a severity level six non-person felony. Uh, my client, and we felt that that penalty was wholly appropriate and adequate. We did not seek to change that. Senate Bill 172 keeps that the same. What we did do, however, is create the comprehensive framework so now more entities fall under that category. Uh, what we did do, and I really believe this is the peanut of the bill, is we increased the penalty for aggravated criminal damage. We've assigned that a severity level five non-person felony. And as you look at the sentencing grid, which I know this committee uh, uh, deals with often, I've attached it to the second page of my copy just for easy reference, that is certainly a stepped up penalty. And I want to talk about that specifically. There is probably not a citizen across the state of Kansas or one of your constituents that's going to accidentally commit that crime of aggravated criminal damage. That's reserved for that individual who wants to knock out that water treatment facility, disrupt or damage a pipeline or an oil refinery or one of those critical infrastructure facilities. That penalty is reserved for the individual who wants to create sustained damage. That is just not for someone who accidentally trespass on a on a uh, wind turbine when they're out pheasant in western Kansas. 
Members of the committee, as I begin to wrap up, I have spoken a lot about Kansas industry today, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the thousands of Kansas employees whose sole job is to work these pipelines, keep that electrical grid safe for us. We have certainly come to rely on those individuals more than we normally would have this winter. Their work environment is already very complicated and dangerous. We don't wanna add criminal mischief onto their plates. Uh, I wanna leave you with one real life example. Just a few weeks ago, a day or two after the Super Bowl in a small little town of Oldsmar, Florida, a hacker gains access to the local water treatment facility that serves that municipality of about 15,000 residents. This hacker dramatically increases the amount of lye in that drinking, drinking water, and if not for a quick acting engineer who caught that mid-action, shut that terminal down, by 9 a.m. the next morning, the residents of Oldsmar, Florida would have had water so contaminated it would have been poisonous to the touch, much less if it was ingested. The Wall Street Journal had a great write-up on this a few days after the incident. I want to leave you with this quote. The Oldsmar, Florida incident comes as officials warn about the growing sophistication and brazenness of attacks on critical infrastructure. Many attacks are never publicly revealed, but the Wall Street Journal identified targets in a Russian campaign to pierce electric utility defenses by first penetrating trusted suppliers and another effort in 2019 by unidentified hackers who targeted at least, at, excuse me, targeted electric utilities in at least 18 states. The day after the Oldsmar, Florida incident, Senator Marco Rubio, Rubio of Florida issued a press release calling on the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI to treat this as a matter of national security. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we certainly agree with Senator Rubio on this matter. And I would also like to point out uh, before I close, uh, we know that there are two amendments out there. One would add some clarifying language uh, to the telecom and natural gas portion of this. Uh, we are very supportive of that, feel that's a very friendly amendment. There was also a lot of good discussion on the Senate floor with regards to you know, what happens if some 18 year old kids are out and they graffiti an oil storage yard? Are we going to hit them with a felony? And I will tell you that that is not the intent of that bill. And I think we're going to have a, a amendment coming to remedy that to, to strike the deface portion of this bill. We, we do not want to be in the business of locking up rowdy teenagers spray painting oil storage yards. So we are very supportive of that. We feel that that makes that bill better. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll close and stand for questions at the appropriate time. Very good. Committee, I'm going to allow the proponents to speak, then do questions, and then the opponents. Um, that way we have plenty of time. So, Michael, we'll have you come back up, and then we'll do questions for both of you at the same time. All right. Can we start again? I'll start again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Michael Gillespie, Director of Government Relations for One Oak. One Oak is one of the premier natural gas, natural gas liquids, pipeline companies, midstream companies across the country. When I talk about midstream of natural gas, natural gas liquids, that means gathering pipelines, transportation pipelines, refining and storage, along with other transportation. One Oak operates in 18 states. So it has substantial assets in Kansas. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to talk about this important bill on protecting the critical infrastructure um, of our state and of our country. Um, One Oak really takes a cross-disciplinary approach to security, and we have systems and procedures in place to make sure that we have our critical assets are protected for integrity, but also making them safe and reliable in our communities make sure we're good stewards of the environment and ensure the safety of our employees and our contractors. So in 2013, the Obama White House put together a public policy directive focusing on critical infrastructure, security, and resilience, hoping that we have a national unity and effort for strengthening our physical security and making sure that we have something, and I'm going to read this just because it's part of the directive so I don't mess this up. The intent is to have proactive coordinated effort to support and strengthen the nation's diverse and complex critical infrastructure, including assets, networks, and systems that are vital to the public confidence, nation safety, prosperity, and well-being. And we think this legislation helps do that um, and hopefully emboldens that, and that's why we're supportive. When you think about oil and gas facilities for critical infrastructure, you often think of a drilling rig, 
maybe a pipeline, maybe a refinery. And though this legislation is aimed at those critical infrastructure, that backbone, we really need to make sure and think about the end user. We wanna make sure that the pipelines are protected. It helps ensure that the products reach their destination. That could be your home, school, hospital, for the warmth and essential functions that our products help provide. We think this helps that. You know, companies like One Oak regularly perform emergency preparedness efforts, whether it's from a natural disaster or it could be criminal activity. So we go through all of these steps to ensure that if something was to happen, we'd be prepared. Hopefully it never does, but this can help, we think, maybe deter. Um, opponents may say this is a solution looking for a problem because there haven't been any incidents in Kansas yet. And I really hope we never have any incidents in Kansas. But in my opinion, if we can prevent those, um, that is all the better. If you are fortunate enough to have seen one of our facilities or hopefully go on a tour, and I'd invite anyone to come to one of our facilities for a tour, we have rigorous safety that we care about. So not only do you get to the facility, you get a safety orientation, you understand the asset we're specifically at, but you also would don personal protective gear, hard hat, glasses, ear protection, fire retardant gear, boots for, to make sure for any slips, trips, and falls. We make sure, and that's preventative. You know, all our employees wear that type of gear on a regular basis, and we hope that they never come in contact with an incident that would put them in a situation where they would actually really need those things. But that's preventative. And we hope and we believe that this legislation can also hopefully be preventative, hopefully deter um, some criminal acts against our critical infrastructure, you know, the backbone of our committees or communities, the backbone of our state. And I, we we'd hope you support this legislation and move it forward. I stand for any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, I have written proponent testimony from Northern Natural Gas, Water One, American Petroleum Institute, AT&T, Kansas, Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce, Renew Kansas Biofuels Association, and then Kimberly Swati on behalf of a number of uh, entities with the Kansas Municipal Utility. So make, a, make sure to look at that list. Anyone else here online want to testify in person? Okay, let's do questions then, committee. Uh, Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Some questions for Mr. Kreidler, as time permits, please. I uh, listened with care to your testimony. I must confess to you, I've not had an opportunity to read it all in its entirety. So if I've overlooked relevant portions, please correct me. Uh, but your testimony describes one incident or possibly two incidents, one involving a water treatment plant in Florida, which as I understood it was hacked by Russians, and another facility where an unknown hacker had hacked something, and I'm sorry, I don't recall the details. Uh, do you have any evidence whatsoever that increasing the penalties for these types of activities from misdemeanors to felonies will have any deterrent effect whatsoever on Russians and unidentified hackers. Representative Carmichael, thank you for the question. It is a good one. Uh, I would tell you, I'd love to be able to hop across the pond and wrangle up some of these Russian hackers that are giving us grief. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we're gonna be able to bring them to justice in Kansas. One of the last articles I'd saw in the Oldsmar, Florida incident, they thought that hacker originated from inside the county. So if that's the case, I don't believe they've caught him yet or I haven't seen it in the past week or so. Uh, so if a hacker hacked into the Shawnee County water facility and that individual was from Shawnee County, uh, we could absolutely get him on, on a level five aggravated with intent if we were able to prove it. So I think that is important depending on where the hacker comes from. Now, while I certainly can't do much for the Russians, uh, although I'd like to. I also think, as I've talked to some of our industry partners about this, and I mentioned this in my, in my oral comments, do you, do you guys have examples of this stuff happening? And as I would talk to some of those folks, I heard, yes, we do. A lot, the majority of these attacks are related to uh, scrap metal theft. 
people busting into places to get the scrap metal and then and sell it. But also, they don't talk about these type of things. As the Wall Street Journal mentioned, but I think most importantly, uh, I think it's very fair to say that these large utilities, it's probably not in their best interest. And even in my clients in the oil refinery business, we're not going to trumpet that someone broke into our facility and smashed it out and beat it up. We're simply not going to do that. I also think we live in a uh, period of time where the public's perception of large public institutions are pretty low. And I don't think those companies want to give another reason for the public to not like a large public institution. And also, as I've heard from our national folks, we're really concerned about copycats. So if we trumpet, hey, this is what happened in the Wichita Eagle or the Topeka Capital Journal, there'll be a copycat attacked. So they're just never really talked about. Well, you know, Mr. Kreidler, I'm always very suspicious of testimony presented at a committee hearing that's based upon rumor, innuendo, he said, she said, hearsay, secondhand information, and speculation. But I read with great dismay the testimony of Representative Hasselwood, Hasselwood and uh, Representative Victors uh, regarding the use of this type of legislation to persecute and prosecute Native Americans. And uh, that obviously concerns me greatly, but let's try to take this right here to Kansas and facts that we do know. My bad recollection is that the last time an offense which would fall within the scope of this law occurred within any, any serious or significant scale was in the light, late 1970s when the Sunflower National Guard blocked the railroad train that was delivering the reactor to the Wolf Creek generating plant. And I think it may have delayed the construction by as much as two or three days. I'm sure Representative Schreiber can, can help us better with that. But other than that incident back in the 1970s, can you point to me a single time or place where anything has occurred in Kansas that would fall within the scope of this legislation, which as Representative Hasselwood and uh, Victor's uh, greatly fear would result in persecution of the Native Americans. Any, any where this has happened in our state? Well, first off, I haven't read that testimony, so I don't want to comment specifically on, well, on I commend their concerns. It to you. Yeah, um, say it again, I'm sorry. I just said I commend it to you. It's very valuable testimony. I hope you'll have time for it. I will absolutely read it tonight. Um, and so I will tell you again, I have been told uh, these stories in, in private, and I, I'm not going to give the confidence of those individuals because that for reasons aforementioned, they didn't want to testify. So I'm here presenting. Well, no disrespect, but I'm not going to take the word of unidentified secondhand informants in making public policy in Kansas. So I have serious concerns about your legislation. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. It's more than fair. Thank you. Any further questions, committee? I've seen some of you raise your hand and then take them back down. So I'm assuming they're down for a reason. Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Carter. When you mentioned the water treatment plant, which I think we're all familiar with, or at least should be, that was a hack. electronic attack, not physically entering in or remaining. And I'm really looking in, I think perhaps I'm missing, but is this covering electronic attack? Yeah, uh, Representative Wheeler, that's a great question. So when we originally wrote the bill, we asked the reviser that the Senate Judiciary Reviser wrote it. Uh, he said it did. I, I don't think my client would have any problem with belt and suspenders type language. Uh, clearly stating that, we are under the assumption that it does. And I'm under the assumption that it does not. W would love to work with you on some language to absolutely clarify that then. I'm trying to think, and I have some of these critical things in my home county. Uh, I'd like to, I, I've had difficulty prosecuting under this for just an electronic intrusion. Okay. Uh, well, I'd love to spend some time with you tomorrow or later this week, and we could absolutely sit down and, and craft something. Now we have lasers. <laughs> but, uh, and to 
Mr. Car uh, Mr. Representative Carmichael, we had a uh, gentleman who flew over a feed yard in a little one of those kite airplanes, and the federal government did not take that well. These types of things do happen, and you can poison you can poison the population. If that guy had that intention, he was just taking photographs of animals. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Curtis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so, you know, a little bit of research on, on this that I did, this appears to be a bill that's modeled after, you know, 56 or plus bills that have been introduced now in 30 states. And clearly a response to what happened in Stan at Standing Rock. And um, it seems to be, you know, an effort to damper freedom of speech and perhaps directed towards, you know, our Native American community. So I guess I would ask those proponents, you know, are you concerned that we really have a problem here in Kansas? It seems to me like, um, you know, that has not been clear that you've identified that there's really a problem here in Kansas. And I'm just wondering, are you now, you know, is, is this the effort to go around to all of the, you know, to continue to go around other states and... Um, Representative Curtis, we've lost your, uh, you appear to be muted all of a sudden. We got most of your question. Well, we got all but the question, I think. Uh, well, the, the, the question is, you know, are, are you concerned that there is a problem here in our state, um, you know, with, with the Native American community? Because that seems to be what has prompted this whole thing is what happened in Standing Rock. Uh, Representative Curtis, thank you for the question. So I will tell you, I think we have a problem. My client certainly thinks they have the problem. They, they certainly went to the expense of, of uh, in all the trouble of preparing a bill and putting it in front of you. Uh, I, I would tell you our intent is uh, it has nothing to do with protests. Never, ever, ever. That is a fundamental American right. I would tell you uh, the way this bill is written in two different places where it talks about clearly posted and marking, I, I would not protest for instance, again, only to my client's interest, inside the fence of an oil refinery. Although I don't believe it, you would be smart to do that today, regardless of Senate Bill 172. I don't think this does anything with the protest and, and uh, your, first, your First Amendment rights. Those are unalienable, God-given rights, and we don't want to do anything to disrupt that. That is not our intent. Representative Carmichael. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you giving me an opportunity here since it appears we don't have as many questions as we might have thought. Uh, Mr. Kreidler, in your initial testimony, you also told us that there are perceived difficulties with folks breaking into critical infrastructure to steal scrap iron. Now, of course, we can both agree that's already a crime, is it not? It is. Okay. Now, my recollection is that over the several years that we dealt with scrap iron in the Judiciary Committee, going back to 2014, you, I believe, on behalf of many of your clients, perhaps even advocated for the, the scrap iron registry and laws that we have today. So my question is, uh, why? What, what do we need to do to fix the scrap iron theft laws? Because that sounds to me like a, a better way to deal with a, a, a real problem in Kansas so as to protect the interests of your clients. Wouldn't that so be a I better would way you, for us to fix this problem? Is to it's fix a great, scrap iron law? Great question. One, I was lucky enough to have absolutely nothing to do with that scrap metal law. Uh, <laughs> I know there were hundreds of hours of testimony, and I see that there are war wounds from my friend Representative Schreiber back here who worked on that for years. I luckily had nothing to do with that. Uh, I would tell you, those. I, I truly believe Senate Bill 172 and the scrap metal legislation that's currently in, in Kansas law are two vastly different things. One, if you want to bust out a, a, some sort of CIF, but you want to sell scrap parts, that's something totally different than an individual po poisoning a water treatment facility. That's what our intent of this bill is to be a deterrent to stop that. Uh, scrap metal, that is a whole nother ball of wax. 
Well, then I will, I will strike from my mind your testimony regarding difficulties, or perhaps it was Mr. Gillespie's testimony, uh, with difficulties uh, regarding scrap of, or theft of scrap metal, and that being the reason we need this uh, legislation. Uh, my second question for either Mr. Gillespie or Mr. Kreidler uh, refers to my good friend from Garden City's uh, concern about overflights uh, and the like. Gentlemen, my recollection is there's a whole penelope of federal crimes that apply to aviation related incidents, to international computer hacking and cybersecurity concerns, uh, to interstate uh, racketeering conspiracies and the like. Why are those federal laws ineffective in dealing with international criminal conspiracies and how in the world would a, a, a non-person felony in Kansas change any of that? Representative Carmichael, I, I have no knowledge of aviation statutes or, or anything like that, so I certainly don't want to talk about that. Uh, again, as we talked about earlier, uh, I think for a whole host of reasons, if I could go to Russia and smack some of those uh, hackers around, I certainly would. If there's the ability for that hacker to, to be in from Kansas, then, then this is something that we could use as a deterrent. And I appreciate that straightforward answer. I'll strike uh, aviation concerns and scrap metal both off my list of reasons that we need to uh, uh, enact this legislation. I appreciate your patience, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any additional questions for the proponents? Okay, committee. Uh, neutral, we have one written neutral from the KCC Utilities Division. Anyone else is a neutral? Let's move on to opponents. And we have Zach Pastora. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the committee, it's uh, an honor to be before you and to see you all. Uh, I think this is my first time in front of House Judiciary, so it's a, it's a pleasure. I, um, not trying to go without uh, testifying before a committee this year without saying that's uh, I really appreciate your public service, especially at these uh, tough times for Kansans. It means a lot. And y'all uh, come up here uh, or participate virtually and, and as uh, carrying out the state's business is really important. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, the proud lobbyist, Zach Pastora, proud lobbyist for the Kansas chapter of Sierra Club. We have nearly 5,000 members across the state of Kansas. Um, Sierra Club, for those that don't know, is one of the oldest and largest grassroots environmental organizations dedicated to protecting the great outdoors. Um, and we're one of those environmental organizations that uses lawful means to carry out our mission to protect the human and natural environment. That's very key. If we want a law changed, we come to you to get that law changed, or we go to court. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't advocate for our members or supporters to go out, block a highway, or, or damage critical infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, we just want to make that crystal clear uh, because Damage to critical infrastructure is very significant, uh, as we learned uh, with the critical infrastructure failures uh, with the deep freeze that we saw down in the south and, and how it impacted us here in Kansas, and also for the environment. I mean, we poison uh, something, uh, a damage to critical infrastructure and, and contaminated water goes out in the land. That could have devastating consequences for the ecosystems. Uh, but the reason to come before you to testify on this bill is because there's a lot of questions. Um, there's some um, vague language in our view, and there is uh, uh, essentially, in our view, no need uh, for this legislation because our current uh, laws are adequate. Um, you didn't hear about any examples of uh, significant uh, damage to critical infrastructure in Kansas, maybe some uh, an anecdotal examples. Uh, but as it is, we think that current laws are a deterrent uh, because of that. Or, and or, you know, what law will stop uh, that, uh, determined criminal from damaging these things, even if it was a 20 year mandatory sentence, would that really stop uh, these criminals, uh, the criminals from, from taking action? 
Um, so anyway, we, we think that for those reasons, we don't think we need uh, stiffer penalties on the books. But if you look at the bill, and I'll, I'll uh, clue you into section one, subsection B2, line 32 to 33, where we talk about aggravated trespassing, you know, expanding the scope of trespassing in this way could invite a wide array of adverse unintended consequences and penalties for minor accidental infractions. The line I'm concerned with is it declares or impede or inhibit operations of the facility which could equivocate to an accidental infraction. You know, if you're a farmer, you got cows getting loose on the highway, that's the only road into the power plant. You know, is that uh, impeding uh, or inhibiting the operations of the facility? Uh, I would think that any reasonable person, law enforcement or judge would uh, nullify that sort of instance. But as it's written in, in statute right now, it seems to violate it. Uh, if there's uh, traffic on the public road, a broken down vehicle, for example, uh, if, if there's a citizen march going on that's permitted, uh, if that impedes the, the, the uh, entrance into the facility, uh, is that violating the law? So there's just some questions there. You know, the, uh, we agree a lot with the proponents as far as the need for critical infrastructure and uh, its in importance and value uh, to our society, but you also agree with what about those uh, teenagers, you know, the, the, the clever uh, teen that goes up and writes a V and an I on the Agra water tower or what have you, uh, you know, should they be getting over a year uh, and a felony on their record uh, jail time? So, you know, I think there could be uh, some common ground here and we'd support, uh, you know, ways if there is a critical need or an urgency for this legislation down the road, we could work with them on, on providing appropriate uh, penalties for this. But practically, we saw a lot of the legislation uh, creating a stiffer crimes happening after the Standing Rock, the Dakota Access Pipeline, where uh, Native American community on their own land was protesting uh, the uh, pipeline that had a, was going under the Missouri and Mississippi rivers and strong concerns that that was gonna be bad uh, for the air and water. Uh, so, you know, that's where some of these bills came forward, not uh, assuming that's where this bill came from, but just kind of for, for context for some of that model legislation. Uh, you know, finally, and, and this is more generally, we need action right now by y'all on a number of different issues. Uh, Kansas need economic relief. We need to fight uh, this pandemic, get past it as quick as we can, as well as some other important issues on the table. I think this can take some time. We can work with some of the proponents in the off season. And so I would encourage us to think about this, get the language straight, maybe provide for a, a cybersecurity uh, type of a strengthening amendment, making sure that the deface uh, part of, of the bill is pretty clear. Uh, so I will say that. I will also say that we need to kind of zoom out and think about what are the our, um, critical, what are the most uh, pressing dangers, damages to critical infrastructure in Kansas right now? I would say earthquakes, some of the recent earthquakes we're having in Wichita, those disrupt uh, uh, natural gas pipelines. We could have a really bad situation really quick. That's pretty scary stuff because Kansas hasn't had uh, the kind of severity and uh, frequency of the earthquakes that we've seen, oh, in the last seven years or so. So, you know, that may be more important to address right now. Also, extreme weather. Uh, you know, I don't need to tell you how extreme weather damaged, uh, uh, you know, uh, the grid down in Texas and the south and and stressed our uh, energy systems here in Kansas. Uh, but, you know, at some point we got to reconcile with the extreme weather. We got to be thinking about how the changing climate and our atmospheric pollution is having an effect on, on extreme weather and, and what that could do to our critical infrastructure. So just kind of some food for thought at the end. I know we don't have any legislation on that, but just want to provide that to the committee while we're on the subject. Thank you. I'll be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Next, we have Adara Corbin. Pardon me. I'm not sure if I'm in frame. Um, uh, you're close. You can see me there. See. Oh. There we go. Yeah, we Sorry. can see you. I'm just going to hold it. How about that? Okay. Uh, committee okay. members. My name 
name is Adara Corbin, and I'm a young Kansan learning how to take action to protect my community and its members. I do a variety of work with multiple organizations, a few of which are the protesters in the ICT community for it, of which operate out of Wichita, Kansas. When I learned about this bill earlier today, I was deeply disappointed, uh, but not surprised. I took to write my testimony to present before you all today as a member of a generation that is paying more attention than you may think, and I hope you will listen. I'll make my opposition to this harmful bill swift. I provision of this bill. I will quickly visit the First Amendment, as most people understand it, and I will do justice to point out that 172 the simulation of peaceful, pro of peaceful protests is a great failure. The First Amendment protects our freedom of speech. To quote the U.S. Constitution, Congress make no law regime in establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And I hate to break down the amendment as though you may not already be familiar with it, um, but I would like to take care that we're on the same page about this legislation. No law shall be made by Congress that would impede our right to assemble for redress of grievances. No law would amount to none. None means not one, so this bill already fills that criteria miserably, as it would be one law among many, of course. Moving along, however, um, redressing grievances with a government entity is an imperative part of America's so-called democracy. Assembly is the majority's way or the people's way to ask their governmental re representatives to acknowledge and to tend to injustices carefully and efficiently. Assembly may not be the only way for the people to exercise their voice, but encroaching on that constitutional right should not be considered any less a slap in the face. Let's move on now to see just how Senate Bill 172 implicates such encroachment. One provision of this bill introduces critical infrastructure and uh, bear with me for how um, redundant some of the argument may be, as we've heard quite a bit about it. Um, anyway, the bill introduces critical infrastructure, which is just language being used to make oil, gas, hazardous liquid or chemical pipelines appear necessary and of utmost priority. There are a number of offenses that can be punished by a spectrum of penalties, fines, misdemeanor and felony classifications, and up to four years of jail time for a single act. On the surface, the bill may seem just like a safety measure being taken up by the government to protect people, but we should ask ourselves, why would people peacefully, why would people be peacefully assembling in such areas in the first place, knowing doing so could pose danger to themselves? Historically, pipelines have been protested with fervor because entirely too often they ignore treaty land agreements with indigenous peoples. I could take the time to tell you statistically how many pipelines have infringed upon the terms of treaties thousands of times over, but quite frankly, it's your job to know when entire agreements with other nations are being violated with no regard whatsoever. So I challenge you all to see just how much damage and harm different indigenous peoples have suffered solely from pipelines in this country alone, and then maybe you, maybe you will come to see why any um, individual or collective would place their bodies in such haz hazardous places in the first place. Pipelines pollute water, they disrupt land, they harm habitats. Water is essential for life. Clean water is essential. Clean water is essential. I don't know how many times I could say it, but I'll spare you. Intact land is necessary for agricultural cultivation, community building, and therefore sustenance. Food is essential. Homes are essential. Pipelines ruin these essential parts of any human beings or and others life. When the people have to take to pipelines for protests, it reflects a shortcoming of such a mighty government to ensure its inhabitants can access basic resources. I hope that in your research, you make it a point to understand how these harms affect not only people who peacefully assemble, which is a good enough reason to listen in the first place, because that is your oath, but hopefully you come to see how the consequences of pipelines affect your lives as well. Your, fa your failure to learn and seek this information will reflect poorly on your ability to effectively ex execute your job, more specifically to represent the people, their voices, and their concerns. As I mentioned earlier, we're paying attention. So let's circle back just a little. I'm telling you that Senate Bill 172 is harmful because it strips us of our ability to let you know when something is not right. You're tying our hands in how we can communicate with you about injustices, and you're doing so intentionally. What the pipeline issue demonstrates is that people, indigenous by and large, alongside allies, assemble on critical infrastructure to protect their little means of li livelihood. People are not arbitrarily gathering on critical infrastructure to cry about nothing. Rather, they are communicating clearly that their water, food, homes, and lives are being put in danger by some governmental structure or another. This bill would take someone who is fighting for their life and see to it that they serve jail time for doing so. If you want to make political prisoners out of indigenous people and allies, just say that. If you don't care about treaties, legally binding agreements, and therefore about indigenous rights, then just say that. 
passing legislation to limit the execution of the First Amendment is just passively saying those things anyway. Not only does this legislation clearly serve to quiet justified complaints about extremely questionable measures being carried out for extremely questionable profit, it quite literally will imprison, disappear, or kill the voices of those complaints. Senate Bill 172 thwarts the right to free assembly, a right that is currently used to portray that the right to sustain oneself is being infringed upon in the first place. Policing anyone's cry for help is a terrible look. And as I said multiple times now, we're paying close attention. That is my time. I hope you make the right decision. Next, we have John Shively. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and the committee for giving me a chance to testify. Uh, we are testif I am uh, John Shively with the Sisters of Charity of Leavenworth in Leavenworth, Kansas. Uh, uh, I am the director of our Office of Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 172 today. Um, you have my written testimony, so I won't go through it entirely, but uh, for those of you who happen to know uh, Catholic women religious, uh, some of them tend to be uh, fans of protesting uh, when there are perceived injustices. And... Um, uh, many Catholic uh, women religious have land ethics and belief that uh, care of creation is of the utmost importance and God has given this, this earth to protect. And so um, there are very real implications of this bill for women religious who protest. Uh, I provide an example in my testimony of um, some sisters that are based in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, protesting a pipeline that went through their land. Uh, and one of the things they did is they handed out homemade bread to the workers on the pipeline construction site. Um, they gathered in a circle uh, uh, in the middle of this, this site and sang Amazing Grace. And by my estimation, that uh, would probably fall under the statute in terms of impeding the progress of the building of this pipeline. Uh, the, the bill does specifically address uh, above ground and underground pipelines. Uh, and uh, we are incredibly concerned uh, about the idea that the state of Kansas might uh, be wanting to imprison women religious or Native Americans or priests or anyone of, who has uh, sincerely held faith beliefs uh, for, for long amounts of time uh, on the basis of the statute. So. Uh, we would oppose it because we believe the penalties uh, are excessive and we believe they would apply to people who are simply uh, expressing their First Amendment uh, rights to protest and uh, to assemble. Um, uh, we also know that, uh, we'll know that when you protest, it's generally not consequence free. Uh, many times people are out there putting their bodies on the line for, for some purpose. Uh, but it, it seems to me that the penalties in this bill are excessive, and I will yield the rest of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There you go. Thank you. Next, we have Rabbi Moti Reiber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me okay? We can, yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Michael, members of the committee. I am. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I'm Rabbi Moti Reber. I'm the Executive Director of Kansas Interfaith Action. Uh, we're a statewide multi-faith issue advocacy organization uh, that puts faith into action on behalf of people of faith and the public regarding critical social, economic, and climate justice issues. And I, too, uh, am here because the denominations, faith communities, and individuals that comprise Kansas Interfaith Action take as the very core of our mission the care of God's creation which is a uh, inseparable part of our religious identity and mission. Uh, there are already laws on the books against vandalism, against sabotage, and against putting lye in water supplies. What the real purpose of this bill is, uh, is, is, in, is in putting the in, into place the definitions of trespassing and interfering, quote unquote. Uh, it's part of a national effort by fossil fuel interests and partisan political organizations to stifle political speech in pursuit of their own economic and political interests. So uh, the, the question about protest uh, was brought up by a couple of 
uh, my pre my uh, the preceding uh, conferees. I would say that protest, including civil disobedience, is an honorable American tradition, uh, from the suffrage movement to the civil rights movement, uh, to the climate movements and creation care movements of today. Um, when uh, when the normal processes don't work, when uh, the legislative process is uh, paralyzed, sometimes uh, uh, civil disobedience and other forms of nonviolent protest are used to call attention to an important issue. And I'll bring up the example that was brought up earlier about the protest against pipeline construction in North Dakota. Uh, this was in response to the danger that the pipeline posed to indigenous homeland areas. I'd raise the profile of this issue nationally, as no one can, I don't think you can um, deny that, and change the dynamic around such projects. Um, it is exactly, precisely this kind of activity that SB 172 is, is designed to suppress. And, and if you look at the quotes that are uh, found by the people who actually designed this bill, uh, in Washington, you will see that the intention is to preclude standing rock time type protests. This bill would felonize acts of protest, prohibiting justice oriented faith traditions from exercising their religious duty to engage in public witness in those places where health and the life of people and creation are threatened. I would call attention uh, to the most disturbing part of this bill is the conspiracy provision. So a public interest organization, a nonprofit organization, or even a church that so much as paid for a bus to a nonviolent protest would be subject to prosecution under the RICO statutes. This is a, a direct attack on religious witness as well as on political speech. Uh, to, so I'm gonna conclude, I'll say that this is a template, a cookie cutter bill from outside of Kansas. Uh, it's, being, it's being promoted, I think in 14 states this year alone. It's part of a coordinated effort across the country to criminalize pr political protest and to lock in fossil fuel infrastructure. It addresses a problem that doesn't exist. It criminalizes speech and faith witness, and it completely ignores the pressing existential crisis of human caused climate disruption. We have real problems in Kansas. Climate disruption is one of them. Protests against fossil fuel infrastructure are not. The policy is unnecessary, anti-democratic and anti-climate. We urge you to vote no on SB 172. Thank you, and I'll take questions at the appropriate time. Great, thank you. Next, Davis Hammett. Hello, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I can, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Patton, members of the committee. Um, so first off, I with any legislation, I think the most important question is, is this a justified solution for a defined problem? And that's to really say, is it a carefully crafted solution for a clearly defined problem? I think from today's testimony so far, it's pretty clear that there is not a clearly defined problem. And I'll ask, actually comment on some of the things that were said earlier and mention that the, the water treatment plant cyber attack was shown to be a gross neglect of basic cybersecurity by that water treatment plant. And also when we talk about the cold snap, it's worth noting that we know this was an industry failure of properly weatherizing equipment. So I think it's just dangerous to shift the blame for maybe some industry failures on, onto, onto these other things. Um, back to the concern about how this is crafted is, it, it doesn't actually appear to create any new crimes as far as it goes to the um, damaging and trespassing, it does create that the new pretty complex RICO crime that I think this committee should explore, but I don't feel qualified to talk on. Um, but for the most part, it actually doesn't create new crimes. All it does is increase criminal penalties and hope that that would deter something. Whenever the Senate debated this, um, at first um, it was said that the reviser wrote this, and then it was revealed how the American fuel and petroli, uh, petrochemical manufacturers wrote this. Um, and whenever it was asked why this was justified, a senator said that it would send a message and that anyone around anything defined here as critical infrastructure was up to no good. Um, there's no nuance in this bill. It really just has essentially four severe steps that could apply to so many different people. 
that could apply to someone actually attempting to commit an act of terror and someone just accidentally stumbling onto, uh, onto the wrong piece of property. As far as it goes for the criminalization of protest and really the chilling speech impact, because we have to remember, it's not just if you criminalize a protest, it's how the public interprets the law. And if the public gets too scared that they might accidentally commit a severe crime, so they decide not to express their free speech, chilling free speech is an important consideration. Any peaceful protest committed on property that's designated as a CIF in this bill and the intention is to oppose the CIF could be considered an intention to impede or inhibit the CIF's operation. Meaning that if you trespass and you are protesting, then you are aggravated trespassing, which is extremely concerning how broadly that could be applied. Whenever some of these unintended consequences were brought up in the Senate, it was argued by supporting senators that essentially police and judge, judges would just have good discretion and that they would um, understand this and that people wouldn't be charged with these crimes if they didn't actually commit anything. But I think that uh, essentially the hopes of leniency and understanding of a circumstance or intention doesn't justify passing the cold reality of, of, of state statute. Um, so with that, I would just say that we all want to ensure that the people of Kansas are safe and that their rights are protected, but this bill does neither. It doesn't make people safe and it appears to clearly intrude on their rights. So I'm happy to stand for questions when appropriate and I hope y'all all will oppose SB 172. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Alejandro Rangel Lopez. Uh, can y'all hear me? We can. Awesome. Uh, Chairman Patton, Vice Chairman Ralph, and esteemed members of the committee, uh, thank y'all so much for the opportunity to testify before this committee today regarding the passage of SB 172, establishing new penalties for protests near gas and oil pipelines, or I should correct myself, uh, raising penalties. Um, in my short time on this green earth of ours, um, I've had the opportunity to participate in free speech demonstrations in my hometown of Dodge City, as well as KU, where I'm now attending to attain bachelor's degrees in public administration and political science. I know we may not uh, see eye to eye on a lot of issues that I hold near and dear to my heart and that I participated in demonstrations for, but um, I can assure you that both you and I agree on the importance of the First Amendment in maintaining the fragile balance keeping our republic afloat. Um, it's the legality of peaceful protests that maintains order in this country and most of the time prevents folks from resorting to violent means. Vice Chairman Ralph and I know each other because he's my representative and in pre-COVID times, I was fortunate enough to have conversations with him on issues such as voting rights and poverty in Kansas. However, for the other committee members, I'd like to add some relevant background information on who I am and why I'm with y'all here virtually on this fine Wednesday afternoon. Um, I was born and raised in Dodge City by my parents, Martin and Lucia, uh, who work at National Beef and Cargo, respectively. Uh, they immigrated to the United States from Mexico in the mid 1990s, straight to Kansas and straight to work. Uh, in Mexico, it ain't uh, uncommon to hear about a group of student protesters go missing and mysteriously show up dead a couple months later after government offici uh, officials whom they demonstrated against denied any culpability. That's why whenever I tell them, hey, I'm going to a protest today for X reason, they get extremely worried and continuously <laughs> call and text me during the demonstration to make sure that I'm all right. Um, to make sure that I, that I don't wind up missing and God forbid dead. Um, after more than two decades of living in the US, they still worry about that sort of stuff. And luckily for me, I know that we have a system of, uh, I know that we have a right to free speech and we're protected from rogue officials by the courts as well as systems of checks and balances. Um, but with SB 172, I'm worried that we're beginning, we're beginning the slippery slope towards a Mexico scenario. Uh, to say the least, the First Amendment and its guarantees of protection for free speech and free assembly are necessary components of our democracy and of accountability. Kansans, Kansans have a track record of 
standing by our constitution and of pushing for righteousness, even when it wasn't politically expedient yet to do so. We stood at the forefront of the movement against slavery and the movement towards women's suffrage, and again in the 50s and 60s in pursuing civil rights. Peaceful protests and civil dis disobedience are the bedrock of our state and allow us to continue to strive towards a better tomorrow. Without protests and civil disobedience, the march towards equality would have been much longer and more arduous or would have never occurred at all. Pick any issue area and you'll see that popular movements have been key to garnering attention and support for governmental action. I know that those two cornerstones, um, that these two cornerstones of our Republic are often seen as liberal tools of agitation. However, I do want to know and recall the many issues conservatives hold close and have also been pushed forward by their use. In closing, um, I want to urge you to vote against SB 172 and remember that above all political goals, the, de the defense and preservation of our constitution and the ideals conveyed within it come first. While this bill may pr prove beneficial for you in the sh short term, there's also a strong potential that tactics used within it may also be cited as rationale to penalize demonstrations you may hold dear to your heart. More specifically, I, I want to add, intent is different from effect. Um, while this bill doesn't specifically target natives and protesters, it has that consequence of restricting First Amendment rights for these groups. Proponents can virtue signal about fun fundamental American freedoms all they want, but if it has the if it has the effect, words are not um, matching up with actions. Um, additionally, proponents can't point towards concrete examples not originating internationally, which we cannot legislate against, leaving the only possible outcome being the silencing of free speech in our state. Um, that's all I have to say today. Uh, thank you all for your time, and I hope you take my testimony into consideration in your decision. Thank you. Next, we have Melissa Steeler. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm wonderful. Thank you. Um, Chairman Patton, members of the committee, thank you all so much for the opportunity to present testimony today. My name is Melissa Styler. I'm a resident of Kansas. I work for a nonprofit where I aim to help our communities. I vote in every election and I would generally call myself a good citizen. I also was once arrested for trespassing on what SB 172 defines as critical infrastructure. I offer my testimony to oppose SB 172, but also to share what the reality of passing this law would look like and the people it would harm. Like many Kansans, I was raised in a working class household that sometimes struggled to make ends meet. On numerous occasions, we had one or more of our utilities shut off if my parents couldn't afford to pay the bills while waiting on their next paycheck. I, so I have personal experience here and I have a real passion for the need to have affordable utilities and the difficulty to pay them even whenever you're working full time. Years ago, a local energy company that's now been merged with Evergy requested a rate increase that would impact my community and make it harder for people like my family to keep their utilities on. I worked with members of our community to urge the energy company to withdraw that request for a raise our rates and if they refused with our local government to reject their request. With respect to the honorable American tradition of free speech, we spoke up. We wrote letters to the company, to our elected officials, and to local media. We engaged in peaceful protests by holding a rally outside of their facility. My job at this rally was to pass out flyers about our cause to those who walked by. A worker came out of the facility and called me over to ask what the rally was about. And whenever I walked over to him to hand him that flyer, I was arrested for trespassing. I didn't even know that I had crossed the invisible line from public to private property, but regardless, I was handcuffed, I was brought to jail. Luckily, I had a wonderful private attorney who was able to get the misdemeanor charge dropped, but let's look at the reality of what could have happened to me if SB 172 had been in place. They could have said that my interacting with that worker was trespassing with the intent to impede or in inhibit the facility's operation. Under SB 172, that is a level seven felony 
punishable by approximately two years in prison. I highly doubt that my private lawyer would have been able to get that charge dropped as easily. And I am very confident that the many Kansans who require public defenders wouldn't have had the same attention to their case as I did. I would have lost my right to vote. I could have been sent to prison. It is very possible that I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've been given or the blessed life that I live with a felony conviction on my record. This is the reality of what SB 172 will do. I know that proponents have said that law enforcement will, it would be very unlikely for them to arrest somebody, uh, you know, rowdy teenagers or however they want to frame this. But if we put this into law, do we not expect law enforcement officers to enforce it? You've been told that this bill will help protect our critical infrastructure, but the truth is that it will over criminalize free speech and peaceful protesting. We have laws on our books right now to protect against all of the kinds of acts that you've been warned about. These laws we already have offer punishment that is more proportionate to the crime. This bill is broad, it's heavy handed, it's overreaching. I urge you to please vote in opposition. Thank you so much for your time and consideration. I'm happy to stand for questions when appropriate. Thank you. Committee, we do have some written opponent testimony uh, from Representative Victors, Representative Haswood, Reverend, Reverend Johnstone, uh, Maddie Bell, and the Climate and Energy Project. Anyone else as an opponent in person or online? Okay, I don't see any, so we'll move on to questions. First, we have Representative Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will make this quick because I know we're, we still have much to do. So, Mr. Pastora, if you don't mind, I just, I, I, I think possibly um, you've worked this out because I saw you talking over there, but I just wanted to mention that you, you're in your testimony, um, sorry, I just want to pull it up. You were concerned that um, the aggravated both, there's two, there's trespassing and there's critical damage and then there's aggravated on each of those. But you were concerned with, um, sorry. Yeah, the uh, line 32 and 33, yes. mm -hmm. section one, so, yeah, subsection Yeah, but if you D2. keep reading it, that, because you, you were concerned that there would be accidental damage. Or, right. But, you know, it's really clear that for to be the aggravated, it's with the intent, with, not with an intent to... Um, cut off, you know, the, the, so you're smiling, you understand what I'm saying? I understand or, what you're okay, saying. Uh -huh. I, I, and, and maybe it is my mistake in, in understanding, but as I read it, you know, later in the bill, it says, or the intent to in, in, impede or inhibit operations of facility under a different definition. But under this definition, it does not say in the intent. It does later, earlier when it references other types of activity, but then it goes to, or impede or inhibit operations of the facility. To me, that means it's unintentional uh, in that section. So unless I'm mistaken, which I'm, I'm happy to defer to those that know the, the, the law uh, better than I do, that's how I read it. And so I just wanted to make that clear because, you know, we need to make this crystal clear to, to make sure that it has the effect it's intended. Yeah, it definitely does. I think if you read up, you know, knowingly, and then it says with the intent to damage, destroy, vandalize. Anyway, so um, right. just I needed to point that out. I, I appreciate it, Representative. I'd just okay. say, you know, if you could, before that extra section, impede or inhibit operations of facility, but or the intent to impede or inhibit operations of facility would make it clear that it's all intentional. But I'll leave that up to the to you as the policymakers. We'll take a look at it. And then just one other quick thing, if I may. I, my question could be for any of the opponents, but not Mr. Pessor, not uh, you didn't address this specifically, but okay. any of the others that talked about protesting. And it could be Mr. Shively, or it could be any anyone actually. I, I don't really, I, I'm, I don't see that the First Amendment gives us the right to trespass when we're protesting. And so my question is, 
Of course, we want people to be able to have free speech, exercise their religion, you know, gather all of those things and protest. It's really important. But I don't see that we are we have the right to trespass as we're protesting or um, that we have the right to damage. And so I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. And, and then the, the last thing I'll say, and this is around, all in this, is that this bill, some are saying it's not necessary, but, we, but the, what's necessary is we're adding to it critical infrastructure. There's a whole list of other things we're adding to it. That's why this, this law is much more comprehensive. So if you, if you don't like the fact that we're upping the penalties, that's one thing. But, of course, we're adding a lot to it, too. So if anyone would like to answer the trespassing question or the, the, if they can explain to me why it wouldn't be necessary when we want to include other uh, infrastructures. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it's, it's Rabbi Reber. I, I, I would say that people who undertake protests that includes civil disobedience understand that their activities are illegal and they're prepared to um, take a consequence for them. Uh, the question is, a ma it's a matter of degree. So if someone is doing uh, nonviolent civil disobedience for a political point, we're taking the, if you take the tactic of nonviolence and the, and the motivation of political protest into account, then the punishment would take that into account also. This bill Criminal penal, fenal, felonizes that activity, so it treats it much more uh, comprehensively or much more um, dramatically than is currently under under un, is, than is that is under current law. People who take people who protest in that way understand that what they're doing is illegal and that they might get a consequence. There's a difference between a fine or a civil penalty and a and a you know seventh person felony you know, a seventh degree non-person felony. And I think, and the other part of this is the RICO statute part, which really includes uh, organizations and, and communities that might support a protest like that. Uh, that. That they're added to this also in a way that is also, again, very dramatic. I think uh, Modi hit the nail on the head. I would just add one thing is that in the example I gave of the Adorers sisters in Pennsylvania, this pipeline actually ran through their property. Uh, and so the, the I mean, the, the exacts, the, you know, I don't know what the uh, exact property setback from that pipeline was, but, uh, you know, we're starting to get into a world where we're debating whether someone can have a um, a protest on their own property, perhaps, because the pipeline is uh, does run through private property. Yeah. Um, okay, next yeah. we have... Thank you. We have Representative Long, then Carmichael, then Wheeler. Representative Long. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to give a quick comment from my perspective. Uh, I live in a district here in Kansas that has the top three oil and gas producing counties in the entire state. There's at least two, possibly three gas wells on every section of land in Stevens, Grant, and Haskell counties. Consequently, when you look on a map to deliver that gas from that many oil and gas wells, you can't imagine the spider web of pipelines underground and above ground in those three counties. These wells were drilled in 1945, most of them. The installations come out of the ground, the pipelines come out of the ground every three or four miles where the, where the gas is metered, it's, it's scrubbed, the impurities are taken out. All kinds of things happen. It goes back into the ground. It's compressed. It keeps moving along. These these places are, uh, you know, we've lived around them. We've farmed around them. They're remote. Sometimes these these installations are 25 miles from a town. Sometimes they're five miles from the nearest house. Sometimes they're a quarter mile from a house. And I'm talking about my house. They're unattended. There is no security. 
I've heard today that there's really not a problem with vandalism, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that there is a problem with vandalism. It happens. It affects our safety, our economy, and our way of life in my district when vandalism happens. These gas companies don't often publicize the vandalism for obvious reasons, whether that means they don't want to give away a site where it occurred or whatever reason. But vandalism is a problem. Um, I just wanted to give you my perspective a little bit. I will be supporting this bill from a safety perspective, a economical perspective, and a job perspective. This industry accounts for 40% of the jobs in my, in my district, and vandalism is a problem, and uh, that's, that's kind of how I feel. Thank you. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for the delay. Um, I greatly appreciate some of the testimony we've heard here in the last few moments, but I would certainly be compelled to observe in response to my colleagues' uh, no, re remarks just a few moments ago that if the local sheriff is not investigating and prosecuting these crimes, recurrent crimes of vandalism, I'm not at all sure how passing another law is going to cause him or her to fulfill their duty. That observation uh, being said, uh, my question for Mr. Hammett, uh, if he is still with us on the WebEx. Yes, I am. Ah, thank you. Uh, I was looking a few moments ago for the circumstance that I cited uh, in my earlier questions to Mr. Kreidler. And I came across the case of State of Kansas versus Green. It's uh, a 1981 decision of our Court of Appeals. And uh, the site is 5 Canap 2nd 698. And in that case, 35 persons were arrested on January 12, 1979. Uh, for their part in a peaceful protest demonstration near the site of the Wolf Creek Nuclear Power Plant, which was under construction in Coffin County. Uh, these miscreants uh, were each convicted by a jury of two misdemeanors, unlawful deprivation of property uh, and failure to obey the lawful order of a police officer, and they were each fined $50 plus the court costs. I wonder if you could contrast for us your concerns as it relates to civil disobedience, whether it's at an abortion clinic or at a power generating station now under the influence of uh, Elliott management. Uh, I'd like for you to give us your thoughts about the difference between finding someone who engages in peaceful civil disobedience, $50 of costs, and the RICO penalties uh, provided for in this legislation. Could you help me with that? So I, I'm not going to lie. The, I, I, I haven't fully been able to even digest the impact of this because the law is so expansive. Um, I, I suppose the concern here would be that in that case, first off, the, the people in, in this case that you cited, they would be charged with felonies instead, right? So instead of like a penalty, they'd be charged with with felonies, but it's also the lack of nuance because essentially what happens here um, is that any of these actions are treated as if they were intended to be an act of terror, right? Like, because we're there, this is being justified by the assumption that someone wants to like blow up a pipeline or something, but it doesn't have a lot of nuance to go between minor mistakes, petty trespassing, um, and, and an actual intense act. So just that quick swing. Um, and also something that, again, I didn't have the time to pull it all together, but this also seems to interfere with all sorts of other federal and state statutes that I think would be great for the committee to bring together because a lot of these things already are crimes. And if we could understand clearly every crime that already exists that intersects with this and how it will be moved up to this. Um, so sorry, I can't answer your question specifically more greatly, but it's something I'm trying to understand completely as well. Well, Mr. Hammett, I found your answer to be very helpful 
in helping me better understand the difficulties with this legislation. So I appreciate that. With the chair's permission, just one final question for you, Mr. Hammett. Um, you were able to provide us the Paul Harvey version of what occurred at this water plant where there was, Mr. Kreidler described this international security, cybersecurity breach. Uh, but it seems like somehow you knew about the true facts of this particular circumstance that he cited. How is it that just coincidentally you happen to know about the ver one very circumstance that Mr. Kreidler could cite for us? Um, if this is related to the water plant, just during testimony, you could Google and start to read reports of it from news outlets of how the hack had happened. So most of these accusations already there's reports coming out and there's there's ongoing, I believe, FBI investigations going on into that incident. But um, yeah, those were the top reported things in Florida news related to it. Thank you very much for your helpful testimony. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate greatly the testimony of all of these conferees. I wish time would permit inquiry and thanks to each of them. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'm directing this, if I may, to any proponent that feels like he, or she, he would like to answer the question. Um, Ryder, would you want? You know, I remember back in the days prior to 1990 or 2019 session. Boy, I just went back generations. Um, we'd come into this room, and as I'd mentioned to Representative Ralph, we'd have the bill sitting before us. And now we have to kind of go through this thing electronically, and I've done that, I thought. It looked to me like pretty open and shut. I had a lot of answers to myself that I heard being raised by others until I get down to the lower part of section four where this thing just takes off in a direction that I don't understand. Page four, section two, am I on the right page? Where it starts talking about racketeering and you go on down and it talks about unlawful drug manufacture and it's got just about everything in this bill that I don't understand the association to the purpose of this bill. It even seems to have its own sentencing provisions underneath it and how a judge is supposed to sentence and what the judge is supposed to do or not do. And why is that in here? So that's a very good question. We had uh, submitted uh, some sample legislation to the revisor's office and they tied it to the RICO statute and that I believe was in the current statute. So we didn't request that. That was where the revisor thought it should go. Uh, so I believe in that section is current statute already with the Kansas RICO Act. I did notice that it was RICO. Uh, if I Mr. may, sir, I don't think that this is a RICO kind of bill. Um, and I just want to mention that because this bill is 18 pages long, for goodness sakes, on a... Yeah. Yeah, and our, and our sample legislation was was about two and a half. Uh, that that was the way we turned it into the Senate Reviser, and that's the way it came out. Are you happy with it, sir? Uh, my client has approved it. Uh, again, happy to sit down and add this to our discussion list to see how we can make it better. Thank you, sir. Mr. Yes, Chairman, I might clarify um, a, a couple things related to that question. So the the reason the racketeering statute is in here is current law, like if you look at section one, we already have a crime called tampering with a pipeline. And that crime is included in the definition of racketeering activity in RICO. Um, we're getting rid of that crime and we're replacing it with these four new crimes. And so um, <clears throat> you would, you know, at the very least have to do some technical cleanup to remove the reference to the crime that you're you're getting rid of. That that's why that RICO provision is in there. Um, and I, I think it probably looks like there's more changes being made than than there are just because that statute is really long. Um, and then Representative Wheeler, the um, the sentencing statute you referenced, 216604, the only change in there um, is is related to restitution again because there were already some provisions for the old crime. So I, I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Heiberger. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a revisor question, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, this is just brought up. Uh, Representative Long's questioning uh, led me to this inquiry, but I've got a hypothetical for the riser. Uh, imagine, imagine I've got a quarter section somewhere. Uh, it's got a fence all the way around it. It's got no trespassing sign posted. In the northeast corner of it, there's a uh, well pump with a pipeline attached to it. Southwest corner, there's a pond. And my friend, Representative Carmichael, climbs over the fence and goes swimming. Seems to me that under the under the statute, he's just committed racketeering. Is that accurate? Mr. Chairman, I, I might want to um, research that a little bit more, but I mean, as as long as that did qualify as trespass um, on one of these critical infrastructure facilities, um, which by that definition, I, I believe it does, then yes, that would qualify, um, that would be included in the definition of what racketeering um, activity is for purposes of the RICO Act. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Schreiber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Natalie, this question, um, I, I kind of implied it from what you said earlier, but when the um, current law about tampering with pipeline has now been deleted and replaced with this, I did a quick Google search on the website, on the legislative website, um, and I didn't see that we have defined critical infrastructure facility before in any of our statutes. Is is that correct? Is this is this a new def definition and includes a lot more things than just pipelines now, so that we don't have a separate um, statute for each kind of facility? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it looks just based on a brief. Um, Kind of perusal I, i'm able to search our statute base we do have a definition of critical infrastructure uh, that's different than than this in ksa 66 1284 um, obviously for purposes of this section we're defining critical infrastructure a little bit differently uh, which we do all the time but yes in the now that pipelines are included in that definition um that underlying crime which exists right now is covered also by this um, new crime we're just expanding um, the type of facilities that would would qualify thank you thank you mr chairman representative ralph thank you mr chair just a brief comment we this committee sees such a volume of conferees in here and Appreciate all of them, but so many times the the volume is is mostly associations and groups. And I just wanted to to comment or compliment the the number of individuals we've had appearing here today. And I think frequently we get individuals, but I want to tell folks how much appreciate individuals being here to express themselves in this process. Um, maybe even with a brief shout out. Most specifically, I, I like the idea of Mr. Rangel from his what I'm assuming is his dorm room taking the time preparing testimony and, and speaking out here today. But I, I think it's it's a critical piece of what we do. And I suppose with all of the downsides to the electronics and the things that have gone on, this is one of those things that's nice to be able to see people reach out and get a chance to actually testify or be conferees in situations where that might not normally have been possible. So just want to express how much we appreciate that. Agreed, well said. Any other questions for the opponents? not see any so we will close this hearing thank you everyone we have one more hearing house bill 2150 natalie could you give us an overview thank you mr chairman house bill 2150 would amend statutes relating to the abuse neglect and exploitation of dependent persons um, section one amends ksa 39 14 30 that's the statute that provides definitions related to this type of conduct the bill would change exploitation to financial exploitation um, and establish that new definition to be used throughout the act. Um, financial exploitation would be defined as the unlawful or improper use, control, or withholding of an adult's property or sources of income, not for the profit or advantage of the adult. Um, the bill also goes into detail um, 
with a few more um, instances that would meet that definition, which you can um, see there. They're also outlined in the brief. Um, the definition of abuse would no longer include the fiduciary abuse um, or the omission, omission or deprivation of goods or services necessary to avoid physical or mental harm or illness to the adult. Um, it would also remove the definition of fiduciary abuse. Section 2 amends KSA 39 14 31. That's the statute requiring the reporting of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Um, subsection A lists um, the people who would be required to report when they have reasonable cause or suspicion to believe that an adult and protective services um, is being harmed um, as a result of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. Um, this bill uh, would add persons who are engaged in postgraduate training approved by the Board of Healing Arts and persons licensed by the Board of Examiners and Optometry um, to that list of mandatory reporters. Section 3 amends KSA 39 33 That's a statute related to the duties of the Kansas Department for Children and Families in instances of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Um, the bill would change all the references there from exploitation to financial exploitation. Um, and the bill would require that when the department receives a report of abuse, um, the department shall immediately notify in writing the appropriate law enforcement um, agency and meet face to face with that involved adult. Um, the bill would give the department 60 working days for that investigation and evaluation of financial exploitation. The bill would further require that the department forward any substantiated findings of abuse, neglect, or financial exploitation. Um, to the regulatory authority um, for any disciplinary action under um, that authority's jurisdiction. Section 4 amends KSA 39 14 38 to allow the adult the opportunity to refuse protective services during the delivery of those services. Um, if the adult does not want to proceed with protective services, then those services would not be continued. And then sections five and six um, make conforming amendments in KSA 39, 1441 and 1443, just to change the references from exploitation to financial exploitation. And I can take any questions. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Scott, there have been so many bills over the past several years from the Attorney General and KDADS regarding exploitation of, of uh, elderly persons and the like. I'm beginning to lose track. Is this new legislation or is this recycled legislation? Mr. Chairman and Representative Carmichael, I am not aware that this legislation has been introduced in the past. The proponents can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I am not at least familiar that this is a redo. Nor could I put my finger on anything specific. Thank you for the assistance. There are no other questions for Natalie. We'll move on to proponents. First up, we have Lindsay Ford. Hello, thank you all so much for your time today. I will try to be brief given the late hour. I know it's already been a long handful in domestic violence. Um, we are here in support of this bill. Uh, KCSTV represents 26 domestic violence and sexual assault shelters across the state of Kansas. And all are, are and um, I'm so sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought. Um, and it, so we're here today supporting this bill. Um, as you all know, abuse is pervasive in our state, and it comes in many forms and dynamics associated with abuse, particularly when it comes to fiscal mouth reliant. We often think about isolation in relation to abuse. Yeah. Switch. Oh, there, we heard you for a second. I apologize. How can you hear there me now? Go. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. My name is Chrissy Katib. I am the DCF Northeast Region Regional Director, and I'm here to testify on behalf of House Bill 2150. Um, I would just like to thank all of you for the privilege of your time today. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about House Bill 2150. We stand in support, DCF stands in support of this bill. We believe it'll modernize the APS statutes and improve for, uh, allow for improved client service delivery. 
Um, this, this bill was passed favorably out of the House Children and Seniors Committee. Um, so it, that has occurred. Um, we did attempt to introduce this bill or a, a bill almost identical, which was House Bill 27 last year, 2700. Um, yet, and then ultimately make a finding about that case. Um, also, I would say, though, the, the main goal is, again, we are meeting with our involved adults and getting them connected to community resources so they can remain in the community in the least restrictive environment and always respecting clients' right to self-determination. There are times when we substantiate a perpetrator and after we uh, allow for that appeal process, that name would be placed on the central registry. To talk a little bit about this bill, uh, I would say that there's four significant um, changes, and I could like to go over those with you. The first is around KSA 391430, which is the allegation types. Currently, when financial cases are assigned to adult protective services, uh, they're assigned either as financial exploitation, uh, or excuse me, they're assigned as fiduciary abuse or exploitation. We are asking that those two allegation types be collapsed into financial exploitation. What we're finding now is when cases come through our protection reporting center, because those definitions are so similar, um, sometimes cases are not assigned correctly. Uh, next, uh, when we did some research and looked at other states in the United States, we found that Kansas was the only state to separate uh, these two types of financial. So when we do our reporting to our national partners, we will be consistent with other states. Next is around KSA 391431 mandated reporters. Um, what you'll see mostly with this is really around change in formatting. What we've done is we've grouped the mandated reporters. So for example, if somebody's licensed by uh, the Behavioral Science Regulatory Board, all of those names will be in one section. Next, KSA 391433 is around the finding timeline. Currently, when a case is assigned, a finding must be completed within 30 days. We are requesting that for the financial cases that we have 60 days to make that finding. Adult Protective Services requires clear and convincing evidence to make a finding of substantiation. So that's a greater burden of proof. Uh, what we know or what we our practice is that we gather supplemental documentation to support those findings. That would include gathering bank records. Um, and we're just not getting a month or two of bank records. We're requesting up to a year's worth of bank records. We're reviewing those bank records and looking for any discrepancies. Additionally, it includes um, maybe medical records, determining whether or not the involved adult has capacity and is able to make those decisions. Um, so we believe that adding that additional 30 days for a total of 60 days will allow us to make stronger case findings and um, those findings can be upheld in case uh, there is a, a appeal hearing. Uh, lastly, it really is around confidentiality. Uh, confidentiality is one of the most basic tenets of social work practice. NAPSA is our federal partner, and that's the National Adult Protective Service Association. NAPSA indicates that we must respect a client's right and keep information confidential. This bill would ask or would recommend would state that if a reporter makes a concern or calls in a concern to DCF, they would only know whether or not the case was assigned for further investigation. Now, I do want you to know that if the involved adult wants to share the results of an investigation or any information, all they'd have to do is sign a release of information. Um, so lastly, that's kind of the big summary of, of the recommended changes. Um, there would be no fiscal impact we would need to make some changes to our um, technology system, but those costs can be absorbed in our current budget. Um, and in summary, I would like to say that we again stand in support of House Bill 2150. We believe the changes are client-centered. Um, they allow for improved practices and it allows us to make stronger case findings so we can protect vulnerable adults. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, we have written proponent testimony from the Disability Rights Center of Kansas Kansas Advocates for Better Care and Interhab. Uh, questions, Committee. Representative Carmichael. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I note on our agenda that I believe Mr. Carrera, I think it is, from the Attorney General's office is listed. It, is he going to be testifying he, he live? Is neutral. No, he is not live. He's he's actually okay. it's written. It doesn't say that on the agenda, but I did go right. back and look, and he is just written on yeah. it. 
Well, yeah, I was somewhat confused because I didn't see him on my participants list and I was going to defer my questions to him, but as he's not here, I'm sorry, Ms. Kativa, you're going to have to be the victim. Uh, first, when you uh, began your remarks, you stated, and perhaps I misheard or perhaps you misspoke, that this bill had passed House, Children and Seniors. I think you're referring to a Senate committee? Uh Yes, and we have that it, it did pass favorably, but then we believe it was recommended to this committee so it could have additional vetting, if I'm saying that correctly, oh, sir. Okay, so it was previously heard by a House committee. Oh, yes, yes, it was correct. I'm sorry. Yes, Representative Carmichael, it came out of children's and children and seniors and then uh, went below the line and towards the end they sent it back to us because we have such great minds, wanted us to take a glance at it. Well, speak for yourself, Mr. Chair, about who has a great <laughs> mind, but so I'm just trying to figure out procedurally, was it heard in House Children and Seniors and recommended out favorably? In other words, should I go back and look for the YouTube of a prior hearing in a different committee? Yes, sir. There was testimony uh, with through the House Children and Seniors Committee, and yes, there is a there is a video with that testimony. Okay, that's important for me to look at before we work the bill so I get the benefit of the work that they've already accomplished. Um, my second question is, you're clearly very knowledgeable about what's going on here, uh, but in the absence of a representative of the Attorney General's office who's willing, who is able to be here to answer my questions, I'm surprised the Attorney General is not a proponent of this legislation. And I'm trying to figure out, did DCF work with the Attorney General? I'm trying to figure out why the Attorney General doesn't support this idea if it is in fact a good idea. Can you help me at all with any of that? Realizing that you're not the right person to answer the question, but he's not here. I will do my best. And I also fully understand I do not speak on behalf of the Attorney General's office. I can tell you that Steve Carr with the Attorney General's office is on the APS Advisory Council. Um, he is aware of these changes and we have uh, worked with him and spoken with him about these changes. I appreciate your best efforts and uh, Mr. Chairman, I certainly want to express my disappointment that the Attorney General's office did not have time to send one send someone to answer our questions here today about this important legislation. Thank you. Representative Keither. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't have a question, but I do want to uh, commend coming forward with this piece of legislation. I have witnessed this very kind of behavior uh, of a very dear friend of mine, and um, it, it's horrific to see this happen to somebody you love. And I just want to say, I think these are steps in the right direction. After as much as I participated in that case, I think these are steps in a good direction and I appreciate you coming forward. Thank you very much. Any further questions, committee? We'll move on to neutral conferees. We have one written, the Kansas Attorney General's Office. Any other neutral conferees? Are there any opponents? Seeing any, we will close this hearing on House Bill 2150. Committee, thanks for working late with me. I ha do have four bills I want to give you in the event we have time tomorrow to work them. The first is 2122, which is the Supportive Decision-Making Bill. House Bill 103, the Power of Attorney Act. 107, UFIPA, the bill that none of us know what it means, but smart people do. And Senate Bill 58, which is the prohibiting the filing of certain liens or claims. So those four we may try to get to tomorrow. I'll try to have a better list uh, for you tomorrow of what next week looks like. The agenda for Monday is growing a little bit more than I hoped it would, but I discovered a couple bills that were assigned to us that I, I overlooked until I saw them today. So we're going to try to get those in Monday. Probably will not have time to work bills Monday, and then we'll have one hearing on Tuesday, and then we'll spend the rest of the time working through the bills that we heard this week and then we'll hear early next week. And hopefully we can get done before the, well, we will get done before the week's over, but hopefully we don't need every day next week, but we'll see. Uh, we want to make sure we package these things up and have them ready so that the Senate, so we have some shell or some deal, some, some things to, to discuss in conference. So 
we'll, we'll, Mr. we'll Chairman, have that ready for you all. Yes, Representative Mr. Carmichael. Mr. Chairman, I, I apologize. I missed the third bill number that you hope to work tomorrow. 107. 107. Thank you, sir. Yep. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. We're adjourned.